Hey everyone, today I'm going to be talking about web components and how we use them here at Gitcrack and across our DevX platform in a way that allows us to reduce repetition and keep our UIs consistently styled and consistently functional. So let's dig into what web components are and how they work. The phrase web components is actually a broader term for three very specific APIs. The first of those APIs is the custom element API, and that defines how the logic and wiring happens under the hood for our web components. It also allows the browser to understand what this custom tag might be and allows us to use it in a way that, you know, might just be like another button or another form element or something. So that's the custom element API. The shadow DOM is basically how we can encapsulate styling and hide away the implementation details of our component from the browser, because to a consumer, they just want to use the component. They don't need to care about what the HTML inside of it is. And then finally, there's HTML templates, which is a browser native tag that facilitates reusability of markup and template. Before we get too deep into the implementation details, let's dig into the history of web components, because they actually date all the way back to 2011 and a talk that Alex Russell gave at the Frontiers conference in Amsterdam. In that talk, he talks about uh, reusable components and model-driven views, and basically the way that we think about web applications today, it's not a new idea, and it's been talked about and thought about for over a decade now. Then, in 2013, Google published Polymer, and Polymer is basically a proof of concept for what we've come to know about web components. They were able to publish it, get people using it, take that feedback, and bring the specification from the W3C forward. And it wasn't just a proof of concept, the original canonical implementation of material design was a set of Polymer components. With Polymer proving out the concept of web components, and the standard solidifying, and Internet Explorer usage dropping significantly, the world was actually ready for web components by about 2017. Uh, at that time, Ionic created Stencil, which was a framework around web components to make them easier to use, to make them more lazy loadable, things like that. And then a year later, Angular released Angular Elements in 2018. And Angular Elements are a way of writing web components using standard Angular syntax. You would just write an Angular component, and then you would export that component as a custom element to be used in any framework that supports them. And if you're interested in what frameworks support web components these days, I recommend checking out custom elements everywhere. So to understand things a little bit better, let's create our own custom element, our own web component. It's going to be a countdown timer. It's going to have its own tag, countdown timer. And it's going to take in a data attribute that is just a number that we're going to count down from. And when it's done, we can fire an event out to the browser. The way we define this component is just by creating a class that extends the HTML element class. And it's very simple from there. There's going to be some wiring under the hood that the HTML element is doing for us. But for now, let's just make sure that we're looking at the way it's defined. And then we'll dig into some of these callbacks that are going to be a little more familiar to us if we're coming from a web framework point of view. The connected callback is actually what fires when we mount this element into the DOM. Right? You can think of it as being similar to an Angular element's ng on init, or a, an old class-based React component's component did mount. Or in a new React hook-based component, you would maybe consider it the use effect with an empty dependency array. This is just the thing that fires when this thing is first created. And in that, we're going to actually set up our template and inject that into the inner HTML. We're also going to create some uh, you know, variables or properties that we can access later to prevent from having to do query selector logic all over the place. And we're also going to bind up our click handler as well to a method that we're defining lower. But the connected callback is not the only callback we care about and have access to. There are three other callbacks we want to be aware of, and they all together basically represent the component's lifecycle within our website or application. So we have the connected callback when this thing is put into the DOM. We then have a disconnected callback, which is where you might want to clean up some intervals or timers or anything else that might leak memory. There's going to be the attribute change callback, and that's where maybe a data attribute coming in from outside of our application might change and cause us to change how the component is rendered, or maybe resetting timers or things like that. And then the last callback is not really uh, familiar to us from any other web framework perspective. That's going to be the adopted callback. Once we have defined what our web components class will be, we actually need to inform the browser about what this element is, how we want to attach it. So we're going to use the window.customElements.define method, and that is basically the registry I was talking about earlier. We're going to define the tag that we want to associate that class with, because the name of our class doesn't actually relate or have to relate 
to the tag that we are associating it with on our DOM. And that allows us a little more power to keep things branded or more readable for us as developers. One thing to remember, though, is that web components are not perfect. Nothing is. But the rough edges around web components are basically why things like Stencil and Lit needed to be created. They needed to make the developer experience better for all of us. And some of those deficiencies in web components themselves or things that they just don't address are things like bundlers and lazy loading. That's up to us to actually figure out, up to framework or bundler authors to figure out. And luckily, the bundlers have figured that out for us. But it's something to keep in mind. The next thing to worry about, or at least be concerned with, is the Shadow DOM's encapsulation. If you're making a design system, that's actually a benefit, because it means that no external styling is going to interfere with your component at all. But it also means that if you're a library author trying to provide general components for the greater world to use so that they can brand it within their applications, it's a little tougher, and you have to expose those APIs kind of manually rather than letting people just pass in whatever CSS they want. After that, there's the idea of framework interoperability. Now, if you checked out custom elements everywhere, you'll recognize that most of the frameworks these days fully support custom elements and web components. But that wasn't always the case. And even now today, React 18 doesn't fully support web components. However, React 19 does. And it's just something to remember that framework authors have to specifically do this rather than it just coming out of the box for them. And then finally, the last thing is reactivity. So I mentioned that attribute change callback. That is useful, but it's not the same type of declarative reactivity we might be familiar with from React or Angular or other frameworks. Instead, it involves us getting that callback and then doing our own manual DOM manipulation for changing how the UI might look based on a new prop. And that's just not a great experience. So we're going to dig into lit HTML or lit nowadays and see how they help us with some of them. Lit is a library and set of tools created by the Google Chrome dev team as originally part of the Polymer project's efforts, but now it kind of stands on its own separate from Polymer. And it's basically a very small library clocking in at five kilobytes that allows us to work with web components better. It consists of the main packages such as Lit HTML and Lit Element. It also has a React wrapper to make working with React 18 and previous versions of React easier. And it's also got some other things like a localized library and some other stuff that you might not expect or know that you need until you finally need it. And then what if it doesn't exist? So yeah, Lit is really just a broader ecosystem of packages and tools that make web components far more robust than just the specifications and APIs from the browser. When I say that Lit makes web components easier to work with, I should probably be more specific. And we already kind of covered the React package that makes it work in React 18 and earlier. So framework interop is improved. But then there's also the idea of reactivity. So it exposes a property decorator for our class component. And it basically allows that prop or you know, that data attribute to be wired up to how this component is going to re-render when data changes from the outside. And that ties directly into the render function that is also defined by a lit component. And that is more familiar to anyone coming from a React context, especially if you remember class-based components in React, which had a literal render function. Additionally, Lit provides directives that make working with our template logic easier. Things like uh, conditional logic, or looping logic, or maybe even caching, and a key so that we can reuse DOM elements. There's also the idea of context. If you're familiar with React and their context API, it's going to be a very similar API. And it's how we can share state between other components without having to do prop drilling. And then finally, documentation. So I mentioned that they don't prescribe a bundler. You can use Webpack or Rollup or maybe even something else if you want. But they at least provide documentation with making that happen so that you don't have to go and research that all on your own. So really, I think the biggest part of Lit is providing documentation around some of these other things that are not well-defined and not necessarily scoped to the APIs of web components. I hope you enjoyed learning about web components and Lit and how we use those things here at Get Kraken. And I really look forward to expanding our functionality and our usage of web components. And maybe we even bring it into getkraken.dev at some point. But as we start building new tools, we can make sure that we have a good, clean, consistent experience across the entire platform. And that is just better for our users, better for us as developers, and it's just a great experience. So I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you learned something. And I hope to make more videos like this in the future. If you want to see more from me, just like and subscribe below. And I will see you again soon. Later.